So density is like a conversion factor, but it actually describes a fundamental property of substances. So the amount of substance, the mass of it within a certain volume is always consistent. So if you have a cup of water, that's going to have the same density as a bucket of water or any other volume of water. Um, you can kind of treat this like a uh, formula, right? We got D equals D being density is mass divided by volume. Um, but we can also approach these problems with unit analysis. So we calculate the density of a substance by dividing the mass, we take the mass and divide by the volume. So if we have a sample of liquid with a volume of 22.5 milliliters and a mass of 27.2 grams, we can use this equation and say density equals mass divided by volume. We can plug in 27.2 grams is our mass, 22.5 milliliters as our volume and then calculate that uh, 27.2 divided by 22.5 as 1.21 uh, grams per milliliter now you don't necessarily need to know the equation to be able to calculate this because density's units are in mass divided by volume. And so when we do this calculation, that doesn't change. <clears throat> so if you have the mass of something and you have the volume of something, you can always calculate its density. If you wanted to, you could write this out using a solution map. Um, by identifying the quantities that you're given, which could be in a density problem, either the density, the mass, or the volume. Usually if you're calculating straight to density, you'll be given mass volume, um, and then use that to find density. I don't think that the solution maps are as useful for equations, because how would you know that you're gonna put these here if you're just given some quantities? Um, I think instead, you start every problem the same. Actually, I think there's a, yeah. So we start every problem the same in that we write down what we're given. So in this case, right, we have a customer who purchases a platinum ring that has a mass of 9.67 grams. And it displaces, which this is a keyword, which means that it's well, we'll do an experiment where you calculate density. Uh, displacement is talking about the amount of water that it is moving out of the way. So it's similar to if you, you know, pour, or draw a bath, right? You fill a bathtub up, you get into the bathtub, the water level rises. That's your displacement for at least the lower half of your body. So this is a similar thing where you take a ring and you put it into a graduated cylinder where you know the starting volume, the amount that that uh, water rises is something's displacement. So it's a quick measurement of volume. So in this case, our 0 0.452 centimeters cubed is volume. Right this, that's our mass, that's our volume. And then we're asked to find density. <clears throat> so like I was saying before, uh, if you keep a list on hand of all the equations that we go over, and it's like, I'd say it's less than 10 total equations, like specific equations for the entire class, um, then you can look at these and say, I've got mass and I've got volume. And then if you've got a table of, thank you, of equations, you can match your given quantities with your equations and see, well, which one of these equations do I fill at least or all but one of the variables. Right now we only have this one equation, so it would be density. Uh, the other way you could solve this 
is to look over here at the given density of platinum is in grams per centimeters cubed, which is a hint that those are the units of density we'll be using here. And we have grams and we have centimeters cubed. So if we take our grams and divide by centimeters cubed, we'll get units that match this, which are units of density. So if we do that, D equals 9.67 grams divided by 0 0.452 centimeters cubed. We will get 21, using the correct number of sig figs, 21.4 grams per centimeters cubed. So based on this, we've calculated the density of this customer's ring and that density matches the density of platinum. So it is actually a platinum ring. Anything out of platinum should have the same density. Any questions about this? Cool. Uh, we can also use density as a conversion factor. So if we know the volume of something, or if we know the mass of something, we can calculate the other quantity. So if we have a liquid substance with a density of 1.32 grams per centimeter cubed, what volume should be measured to deliver a mass of 68.4 grams? So we start with our givens, 68.4 grams is a mass and 1.32 grams per centimeter cube. And we're asked to find a volume. So again, two ways to solve this. I mean, of course, we've been working on density problems. So you might think, oh yeah, density equation, obviously. Um, but again, you can look through your list of equations and say, I have density. You could even write that as right, D. Let's say I have density, I have mass. If I use this equation for density, I can plug in density, I can plug in mass. We can do a little bit of algebra and we can solve for volume. The other thing you could do is recognize that this is grams per centimeters cubed, which is, it's not a lot of room on this one, which is the same as 1.32 grams per centimeter cubed. There's always an implied one there, which is a conversion factor. So if we take our mass of 68, 0.4 grams, and we multiply, because this is a conversion factor, that means we can invert it. We say one centimeter cubed over 1.32 grams. So when we multiply, we can cancel out the units of grams. We'll be left with centimeters cubed, which is the volume. So this will be 68.4 divided by 1.32. We'll get 51.6 centimeters cubed. Any questions? Yeah. So we can invert it because 1.32 grams is going to occupy a volume of one centimeter cubed. So they're equivalent units. How do I get the one from the one centimeter cubed? This one? This one? No, the first one. 
This one. Yeah. Whoops. Yeah, so I wrote it here first and then moved it over here. So uh, anytime, so when we talk about miles per gallon, or we could say, you know, car gets 22 miles per gallon. We have to be dividing by, well, we know it's miles per a single gallon, right? That's how far you'll get on a single gallon of gas. This is the same thing. And actually any unit that is something per something, uh, we usually normalize it so that it is one on the bottom. Oh, divided by 68.1. Yeah. Finger slipped. Like I said, two ways to solve this though. You could always just use, in this case, the density equation. So if we were to rearrange this equation to solve for volume, we have multiply both sides by V, divide both sides by density. So we would get volume equals mass divided by density. So if we plug in our numbers, we get, and I'm gonna write this so you can see the parallel here, our volume, is mass divided by density. Zoom in because this is going to be small. <clears throat> this is 68.4 grams is our mass and 1.32 grams per centimeter cubed is our density equals volume or I guess in this case, right, it would be 51.8 centimeters cubed. So we end up getting the same answer. We actually end up setting up the problem the same because to multiply 68.4 by one, we then get 68.4 divided by 1.32. So, uh, using density as a conversion factor, um, they're all different things have different densities. Um, the reason that wood floats in water is because it actually has a lower density than water. Ice floats for the same reason. So water has a density of one. Ice has a density that's slightly less than one, therefore floats in water. So you could use a table of these common densities you can say, well, if I need to pour out, um, I mean, if you're baking a cake and you need two cups of water, but you lost your measuring cup, but you had a scale instead, you could say, well, if I need, I shouldn't have said cups. <laughs> Let's say you need 500, 500, we'll call it centimeters cubed, centimeters cubed and milliliters convert one to one. It's the same volume, just different units. So if you needed 500 uh, centimeters cubed or milliliters of water, H2O, you could instead measure out using our conversion factor here of one centimeter cubed per one gram of water. You could measure out 500 grams of water instead. So we're just converting from a volume to a mass and you can go back the other way as well. <clears throat> okay, let's see what else. I am going to, for the sake of time, move on now to chapter three. So now we can finally get past, well, not past, we're gonna build on top of this knowledge of unit conversions, but we're gonna shift gears a little bit here and start talking about 
more chemistry related topics rather than general science topics, um, namely matter and energy. So everything that you see is made of matter. If it, it will, if it occupies space and it has mass, then it's made of matter. Uh, if it's not, then it's nothing. There are different kinds of matter. Uh, well, different kinds of matter are related to the differences between the molecules and atoms that compose matter. We talked about this in the first lecture that different materials have different properties because of the atoms and molecules that they're made of. And by understanding them at a base level, we can understand them at a larger level and use them to make things like iPads or cars. I really like the shirt. You occupy space, you have mass, you matter. Um, matter is defined as anything that occupies space and has mass. So some types of matter are easily visible. I mean, things like wood, fabric, uh, glass, um, right? See those all the time. Throw anything that's made of metal, all visible, easily visible types of matter. Other things that are uh, impossible to see without magnification would be like bacteria or DNA, viruses, right? They are also made of matter, but they're so small that we can't see them individually without magnification. This is one of the trippiest things that we learn in, or that you learn in chemistry, I think. Uh, matter may appear smooth and continuous, but it's actually not. There's actually a lot of space between the solid centers of atoms and molecules. Um, and so if you were to zoom in on anything at an atomic level, you would pretty much be able to see right through it. And you would see that it's very discontinuous. Um, if there was no repulsion between different atoms, you could pass straight through this wall without touching any of the atoms of the wall. <clears throat> so with these fundamental building blocks of atoms, which comes from atomos, meaning uh, indivisible particle, we can bind those together to form molecules and get more complex things with more com or different properties. And then from those first slides, we saw water was made of, as I wrote it earlier, H2O. They combine in specific geometric arrangements. So every water molecule is in this arrangement, and it has one oxygen and two hydrogens. Ultimately, all matter is formed of atoms. Um, for some substances, the atoms exist as independent particles, so like things like air uh, or water. For other things like aluminum, right, they're all stuck together and they act sort of as a single unit. <clears throat> oh yeah, and the other substances, something like isopropyl alcohol, we have well-defined structures called molecules. We usually represent them in these space-filling models. And if you look at these, we're looking at all these molecules from different angles, but they all have the same number of carbon atoms, which are the black ones, and then hydrogen atoms, which are these white ones. And then they all have a single oxygen, which is that red one. So even though they're spinning around somewhat separate from each other, they will all have the same properties because they are all identical, the same configuration of atoms. So you can use a scanning tunneling microscope actually to look at really like a shadow of what atoms are like. So each of these little bumps is actually an atom here. And then we're seeing the shadow that it casts behind it um, from the scanning tunneling microscope. But you can, in, you can distinguish these individual atoms uh, as blue bumps. This next one's even cooler, though, because this is a scanning tunneling microscope image of DNA. Uh, I'm going to try and draw this. Had a hard time last night. There. Yeah, see, I lost it there last time, too. I think it goes here. 
Oh no, it goes here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's better. I think I got it. So right, there's that double-stranded helix of DNA actually being visualized as it is on what I'm sure is uh, a very, very special surface. But right, we can confirm now after hundreds of years, well, yeah, hundreds of years, um, these things that were proposed based on other less direct observational methods. <clears throat> so the first thing that we're gonna do when it comes to matter is we're going to classify it, right? We're gonna break it up because right now, all we know is that everything is matter and it's really hard to deal with everything at the same time. Uh, so we're gonna break these up into groups and talk about them in these individual groups and discuss the properties of really why they're grouped that way. So the common states of matter, all very familiar with, um, we have solids, liquids, gases. Uh, water is the easiest example of this because we encounter almost every day uh, solid water or ice, liquid water, and gaseous water. So in the solid state, solid matter, um, these things will actually probably be fairly intuitive, right? Solid matter, uh, molecules and atoms are closely packed to each other uh, and they don't move around each other. They kind of have their little spot. They got like their parking spot and they vibrate. <laughs> they vibe in that spot. But they don't go anywhere else. Um, and that's evidenced in things that we know of as solid matter, right? There are some things like this has some flex to it, but not a lot. It's a solid. Um, they have a fixed volume, fixed volume, and a rigid shape. We can subdivide solids a little further. We can talk about crystalline solids, where atoms or molecules are arranged in patterns with a long repeating order, uh, or long range repeating order. I think one of the, I don't know why I'm attempting to draw this. Um, diamonds actually take their shape from the fact that they have a crystalline structure. So a diamond is crystalline carbon. And if you were to zoom in sort of like this here on any piece of that diamond, at least in a perfect diamond, um, you would see the same exact pattern of carbon atoms bound to other carbon atoms. Zoom in on another part, any, any part of it, it's gonna look identical. Amorphous solids, which is actually most solids, um, right, it's here, diamond, <clears throat> um, do not have this long range repeating order. The molecules, um, I guess even the aluminum we saw earlier looked more crystalline than it actually is. They are stuck together, they stay in their spots, but there's no rhyme or reason necessarily to why they're packed together that way. Um, and if you look at one part, it's gonna look, uh, well, it's gonna look jumbled and clustered, but it's not gonna have a pattern that repeats in any part of the sort of entire structure of that solid. Kind of like if you took a snapshot at any moment of like Times Square, all those people packed closely together, or closer to a liquid, um, it's gonna look different from time to time. And it's gonna look different from place to place. Um, so the less intuitive amorphous solid, it's actually glass. It's not a crystal structure, unless it is a sapphire crystal, um, which some smartphones do have. But glass is an amorphous solid, something like um, wood or metal are amorphous solids. Moving on to the liquid state. Now we have, again, atoms and molecules that are closely packed together, but with the freedom to move around each other. <clears throat> oh, here's, here's a good example. So it's like um, at a solids or like people uh, at the front in a concert standing right up against the stage. They pretty much stay in their spots. They may be jumping up and down. They might move around a little bit together, 
pretty much in their exact same spots. Uh, liquids are more like times square, where there's people moving from one place to another, they're flowing around each other. Um, during rush hour, completely packed shoulder to shoulder. So because they're packed closely together, liquids have a fixed volume. They're always within close contact, they're always sort of within touching distance. <clears throat> but because they can move around each other, they assume the shape of their container. They're able to flow freely around. Um, so they'll always occupy the same volume, but it doesn't have to be the same shape. Gases are in at least these ways, the exact opposite of solids. So now instead of having uh, atoms and molecules within touching distance, they're actually separated by huge distances. Um, and when we talk about gases later, we kind of assume that they are infinitely distant from each other. So they're completely free to move around. Um, because there's all this space in between them, they are compressible. So gases will always assume the shape and volume of their container. This is why if somebody's cooking in one part of your house or apartment, um, that smell of, you know, especially if they're cooking something fragrant like garlic or onion, that smell will spread throughout the entire apartment because those are gas molecules that actually make up that smell. And they'll just get completely evenly dispersed. <clears throat> so compiled in a convenient chart here, we have solids. Again, they're close together. They have a definite shape, they have a definite volume, and they are incompressible. Liquids have some of those properties. They're close together, they have a definite volume, they are incompressible, but they have an indefinite shape. And then gases are the opposite of solids. They're far apart, they have an indefinite shape, an indefinite volume, and they are compressible. Any questions about solids, liquids, gases? We want to talk about plasma, the fourth state of matter. <clears throat> All right, so now we've got solids, we've got liquids, and we've got gases. We can take those now even a step further. Um, we can classify the matter now based on its composition. So what's making up that matter? Uh, we have pure substances, which are composed of only one type of atom or molecule. And we have mixtures, which are composed of two or more different types of atoms or molecules. And they're combined in variable proportions, which is to contrast from molecules the molecules can be made up of different types of atoms, but they're in fixed proportions. So in contrast, fixed proportions, variable proportions. In this chapter, Maybe even the next, maybe, I think chapters three, four, and five, flow charts are going to be your friend like this. Because we can say we've got all of matter, and we can break matter down into pure substances. Let me make this bigger. All right, so we can make matter down into pure substances, or we can break it down into mixtures. Pure substances can be further broken down into elements or compounds. And then mixtures can be broken down into homogeneous which is different than homogeneous, homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. Let's try and kind of keep this in mind as we continue on here. Actually, looking at these. So if we have a pure substance that's an element, these are look like copper rods. These are made entirely of copper atoms. 
So it's an element. It's only made of one type of atom. Compounds exist of one type of molecule. So these are sugar cubes, and each of these sugar molecules is identical to each other. And the compound is made up of those sugar molecules. For our mixtures, we have homogeneous. So this is like a T. It has, you know, maybe there's a, that looks like a caffeine maybe. Uh, it might have some sugar in it. It's also got water molecules. It's a lot of different types of atoms and molecules together in fixed proportions, right? We could change the amount of uh, sugar in there. You could get a higher caffeine T. You know, these, you can mix these things up. That's a homogeneous mixture. A heterogeneous mixture, so we have two things that are not evenly dispersed. So in this glass, we have oil on top, water on the bottom. So the composition changes throughout the solution or throughout the mixture. It's like we talked about before, elements are pure substances that cannot be broken down uh, into simpler substances. And that's everything on the periodic table. So if you had just carbon or just nitrogen or just oxygen, those would be elements. There's no chemical transformation that can decompose an element into simpler substances. Uh, and we have all, all the elements on the periodic table. Compounds and mixtures. So a compound uh, is another type of pure substance, but it's formed of two or more elements in fixed definite proportions. And these are a lot more common than pure elements. Pretty much everything is a uh, made of molecules, but we can decompose these into simpler substances. Or we could take sugar, and we could burn it, and that would break it down into CO2 and water and simpler molecules um, until we finally get them down to their elements that they're made of. A mixture, which this should be bolded probably, a mixture is composed of different substances that are not chemically united, but just mixed together. So like adding sugar to coffee, that's a mixture. We can separate those out and the proportions can vary. So mixtures are all around us. The air we're breathing right now is a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, tiny bit of argon. Um, and seawater is also a mixture. It's got salt in it. Um, and if you've ever left something out that got wet with seawater, when it dries, it leaves the salt behind. So that's a, actually a physical separation of the water from the salt. Um, both examples of mixtures. Mixtures can be classified then further uh, by how uniformly they mix. So a homo homogeneous mixture has the same composition throughout. Uh, the easy one is air, right? So air, pretty uniform composition throughout. Um, you could even call like coffee. Could be a mixture, especially black coffee. Uh, heterogeneous mixtures are, have a different composition that's not uniform. The example I always come back to is chicken noodle soup. Because for those first few scoops, you're gonna get a lot of noodles, you're gonna get a lot of chicken. But as you start getting farther down to the bottom, uh, you're gonna be running out of the good stuff and just getting broth. Similarly, you could scoop out part of that and only get broth even at the very beginning. So that composition varies throughout. Uh, other examples would be like the oil and water. Um, or granite. 
So composition of granite varies throughout, um, or a lot of concrete, which I might have spelled wrong there. Uh, we'll have a, in some areas we'll have lots of rocks, like larger sized rocks, in other areas won't have so much. Right? So the composition is variable. All right, so I want to classify these as either a pure substance, oops, pure substance or a mixture. And if it's a pure substance, we can further classify it as an element or compound. And then our mixtures can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. So mercury in a thermometer, is it a pure substance or a mixture? Pure substance, right? It's mercury. Um, so we got a pure substance. And then element or compound element. Exhaled air, pure substance or mixture? Mixture. Homogeneous or heterogeneous? Homogeneous. Nice. Chicken noodle soup. <laughs> um, Sugar. It's a pure substance. Some disagreement. Uh, yeah, and it is a compound. Now, of course, you can really get into the weeds. You'd be like, well, what if it's not all sucrose? What if it's got sucrose and fructose? What if it's got, I mean, you can get, you can get down into the details, you get down into the weeds, try to look at these at a more surface level as really broad classifications, uh, rather than trying to say, because you could say that, oh, seawater is not, if you look at the entire ocean, it's not homogeneous because here the water is one way, but if you went to the Atlantic Ocean or the Arctic, it's going to be different. All right, I get it. You thought about it a lot. Thank you for that. <laughs> but if I say seawater, or if I say uh, coffee, or if I say lake water, imagine like a cup of lake water, right? So inside of one cup, if you went to the ocean and scooped it out, seawater would be homogeneous. <clears throat> uh, so again, if we're gonna summarize our classifications of matter, pure substances and mixtures, our pure substances can be elements or compounds and mixtures can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. And I think the best thing, just go back to that flow chart and use that because then you can see the interrelationship between uh, like a homogeneous mixture, um, well, a mixture and being homogeneous or heterogeneous. And most things are going to be mixtures. So now we've taken everything, talked about solids, liquids, and gases. Those are easy. Uh, got a little bit more complicated, a little more into the weeds with uh, pure substances or mixtures. But now we can also talk about matter in terms of its chemical and its physical properties. And so this is sort of a way that you can distinguish one thing from another without having to use a scanning tunneling microscope and look at the individual atoms. So our physical properties are ones that a substance displays without changing its composition. So the characteristic odor of gasoline. Gasoline smells like gasoline without changing it into something else or burning it. Um, taste, color, appearance, Melting point, density, I'll actually throw in here. Boiling point. Those are all physical properties. If you take water and you boil water, it becomes steam, but that steam is still water. It will condense and become water again. Uh, chemical properties are one that a substance displays only through changing its composition. 
So the flammability of gasoline. We can only tell that gasoline is flammable if we light it on fire or have previous knowledge that gasoline is flammable. The corrosiveness, so the ability of something to really degrade or destroy something else. Um, uh, acidity, toxicity are all chemical properties. Uh, so you can take water and one of the chemical properties of water is if you pass it through a really, really special medium, you can use it to generate electricity in hydrogen fuel cell cars. <clears throat> and that would be a chemical property of water. You can also, and this is a fun experiment, take a nine volt battery and you can put it into a cup of salt water. And that nine volt battery actually has enough potential to separate the hydrogen and the oxygen so at one of those terminals, it'll generate hydrogen gas. And at the other terminal, it'll generate uh, oxygen gas. Yes, it's electrolysis. It doesn't last very long because it very quickly corrodes the battery, but still cool. Uh, so the physical properties, the atomic or molecular composition of the substance does not change. When we burn gasoline, we fundamentally change it so it is no longer gasoline. Uh, when we electrolysize uh, water and separate it into hydrogen and oxygen, we are changing it from water with uh, two hydrogens and one oxygen into the separate, they actually bond together, hydrogen and oxygen. Um, so the boiling point of water, like I was saying, um, is a physical property. We can boil that water and make it back into water by condensing it uh, without changing its um, molecular composition. Same for freezing. The susceptibility of iron to rusting is a chemical property. If you ever had a, well, I guess around here we don't get cars very much with rust damage. Bigger problem in the Midwest where they salt the roads because uh, the salt increases the rate of rusting. Um, but you're changing the iron or the steel that the car is made of into iron oxide, which does not have the same properties at all. And that damages the car irreparably. Do you have a question? Literally destroys cars. You can't have an antique car in the Midwest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I went to undergrad in Kansas. So. Um, so that's a chemical property, right? The process of rusting destroys the iron. It changes it from actually iron, right? All these iron molecules together. And it inserts these oxygens, which actually chemically bind to that iron, changing it into something else. Rust. So. Is the explosiveness of hydrogen gas physical or chemical? Yeah. Chemical. Yeah, because we have to change it from hydrogen through the process of explosion. In well, it's water is what it changes into. Uh, the bronze color of copper. Physical, right? You can look at copper, see that it's copper without changing it. Um, the shiny appearance of silver. Physical property. This is a tricky one. The ability of dry ice to sublime. Wait, this is chemical. <laughs> Got some people, physical, everybody else. So it is a physical property because we're going from solid CO2. So carbon dioxide is dry ice. Uh, we're going from a solid and it's going straight to a gas. This actually happens with water in your freezer, and this is what causes freezer burn. So if you leave meat in there, especially not in a bag or something, um, that water does slowly sublime at freezer temperatures, and it leaves the meat. And so then the meat's left really tough, where other things too will be really tough and terrible to eat afterwards. Uh, just for the future, chemical, physical, physical. So 
So in our physical changes, um, generally, we're, if we have a physical change, uh, we're changing its appearance, but not its composition. So right, we talked about solids, liquids, gases. We have ice. We have our water packed closely together um, and not able to move around. When it melts into liquid water, now it's packed closely together, but freely able to move around. Same molecules. When we turn it into a gas, we've separated the actual water molecules from each other so that they're free to move completely away from the other water molecules. So it looks different, has different, different physical properties at that point, but it's just a physical change. In a chemical change, um, the composition does also change. So copper turns green when it's exposed to air or water uh, because it is rusting, essentially. So it's reacting with the oxygen to form a new compound. Uh, one of the, is it gonna be on this thing? One of the hallmark things of a physical change is that it's easily reversible. So we can melt water, we can freeze water. Easy to do. Uh, chemical changes are much harder to reverse, right? Really, really hard to unburn gasoline. Um, so we have state changes for physical. That's where we go from a solid to a liquid, liquid to a gas, or if we're subliming straight from a solid to a gas. In, a, in physical changes, the atoms that compose a matter don't change their fundamental associations. So always the same molecules. A physical change results in a different form of the same substance. The chemical change, our atoms do change their fundamental associations and we get new substances as a result. Um, and matter undergoes a chemical change when it undergoes a chemical reaction. which We'll talk about a lot more in chapter five. So the substances present before are called our reactants. And then we undergo a chemical change to get products, right? The things that are produced. So one example of a physical change would be butane in a lighter. Um, so you push the button on the lighter without turning the flint. And that's going from a gas inside the lighter to, or sorry, a liquid inside the lighter to a gas outside the lighter. So you can uh, vaporize that butane. But if we're, you know, modeling these molecules, right, the butane molecule in here is exactly the same as the butane molecule as a gas. Turn the flint though, and now you've started a chemical reaction where our butane, as it leaves and becomes a vapor, also burns. And when it burns, it's changed into carbon dioxide and CO2 in the flame and produces a flame. Zoom in here. All right, so the composition of these, very different than the composition of those. So now we're talking about not physical or chemical properties, but physical or chemical changes. We have copper metal forming a blue solution when it's dropped into colorless nitric acid. It's a chemical change. I don't think we do that experiment here, but that's a fun one. It's not a very easy one though. Uh, a train flattening a penny placed on a railroad track. Physical change. Ice melting into liquid water. Physical. And a match igniting a firework. Chemical. The easiest chemical reaction to identify is anything that involves exploding, burning, the fun stuff uh, is all chemical chains. So we can actually take the physical properties of different substances and use them to separate. So like I talked about, if you left something out, um, actually, if you just had tap water from around here and you leave it to evaporate completely, it will leave behind a lot of different salts and minerals. Um, same with ocean water, right? That's a physical separation. 
Um, similarly, different liquids have different boiling points. So if you wanted to separate something like, it's actually not too hard to do like citrus oil uh, through a distillation apparatus like this. So you would put up here your water basically soaked with citrus peel, right, orange peel or something, and you can boil it. And that, I think the citrus oil comes off first, don't remember. One of those liquids will come off first and separate itself from that mixture. And then this cools it off so that it condenses, and then you catch it at a flask on the other end. So you take the physical properties and use them to separate things. The other one that's maybe a little more familiar, especially if you like pour over coffee, is separating using a filter. So if you have uh, coffee, for example, you have the coffee grounds, those are not fun to drink. Uh, you separate those out with a filter, whether that's a paper filter, cloth filter, or if you have a French press, a metal filter. And you can pour your mixture of liquid and solids, right, heterogeneous mixture, through your funnel, and then the solids are trapped in the paper, but the liquid passes through. All right, so this harkens back to chapter one again. We were talking about Antoine Lavoisier and him burning things in sealed vessels and discovering that matter is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. In a nuclear reaction, you can get significant changes in mass because we're actually, you're actually converting mass into energy in a nuclear reaction. That's Einstein's famous E equals MC squared. It establishes a relationship between mass and energy. So then theoretically, you can convert between the two. Although we can't go backwards yet. In chemical reactions, however, the change of masses, the changes in mass are so minute, we really just say they don't exist. So during physical and chemical changes, the total amount of matter remains constant. And this is actually super key for any chemical reaction because it allows us to keep track of where our atoms went when we do a reaction. At the simpler level, because a simpler level, because we haven't gotten to uh, how we count atoms, we can just look at the masses of something. So if we did an experiment similar to Antoine Lavoisier, and we took 58 grams of butane and combined it in a chemical reaction called burning with 208 grams of oxygen, do this in a sealed vessel. And on the other side, you would get 176 grams of carbon dioxide, 90 grams of water. But the total mass on either side would be the same. So everything that went into our reaction comes out on the other side, just recombined. So let's suppose we're doing another one of these experiments. We have 12 grams. Let's just set this up like we have other other uh, other problems. So we have 12 grams of natural gas. I'm going to abbreviate here Ng. And we combine that with 48 grams of oxygen, which we too later, but oxygen is generally O2. The chemical change produces 33 grams of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, CO2. And how many grams of water? So then our find here is how many grams of water, which is H2O. So it's probably, I mean, a little bit hard to see maybe when it's written out this way. Uh, we can write, rewrite this. We just write our abbreviations even. Natural gas plus oxygen is CO2 plus H2O. That would be our chemical reaction. So we have 12 grams plus 48 grams gives us 33 grams and then an unknown number of grams. 
So how do we solve for the number of grams of water? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, we can just add these together, whoops, uh, and get 60 grams. All right, so we've got 60 grams on one side, 33 grams, plus some unknown number of grams. You could use X if you want. So subtracting, do I dare risk doing the mental math? Yep. So 27 grams would equal our, uh, well, grams of H2O. 